How often must I forgive? This is the central question asked of Jesus by Peter in today's gospel. Jesus illustrates this teaching with a parable about a king who settles his accounts with the servants in his kingdom. The story describes the forgiveness of a great debt. However, the debtor, after receiving this forgiveness, encounters a co-worker who owes him a minor debt and fails to show the same forgiveness that he just received. The master responds, should you not have had pity as I had pity on you? Some of us might ask, what was the servant thinking? I would never do such a thing. What a hypocrite, what a fraud. However, try putting yourself in the story. Imagine that you are gathered around as Peter asks Jesus, how often must I forgive? How would you respond to his answer? 77 times. Perhaps this is actually attractive to those of us who are drawn to the difficult sayings of Jesus. Especially during the season of Lent, some of us may be looking for these great spiritual acts, feats of magnanimity. Now, I understand this is not for everyone, and I realize that it may not be healthy to encourage such moral scrupulosity. But how then should we interpret Jesus' teaching? Let's put ourselves in the parable. How bad is this servant? He receives mercy, but can't share it. Why? The servant says, pay back what you owe. His demands are guided by truth, his co-worker owes him money, and by justice, pay back what you owe. When have I, while appealing to truth and justice, actually done violence and harm? In what moments do we do injustice when we believe that we are doing good? Within the Christian moral tradition, there exists a tension between love and justice. Anyone who works in conflict mediation understands that sometimes two parties' calcified commitments to their truth can make reconciliation very elusive. Rather, we must suspend our ego's commitment to being right, to truth as we see it, and open our heart to understand the other. In this reflection, I don't wish to diminish truth and justice, but to put them in biblical context. Psalm 85 shows us the way. The psalmist declares, mercy and truth will meet, justice and peace will kiss. Truth will spring from the earth, justice will look down from heaven. And the end of today's gospel confirms our belief in this divine justice. Then in anger, his master handed him over to the torturers until he should pay back the whole debt. And Jesus concludes by saying, so will my heavenly father do to you unless each of you forgives your brother and sister from your heart. In this gospel, it is God, the master, who brings justice. We are called upon to focus on showing mercy. According to the late Jesuit scripture scholar Daniel Harrington, quote, Matthew was writing for a predominantly, if not exclusively, Jewish Christian community, and the teacher was a very important element in Judaism of the time. What Matthew wants to say is that Jesus is the authoritative interpreter of the Old Testament law, of the Torah. The Gospel writer clearly draws upon the tradition of the Hebrew Scriptures. Today's first reading from Daniel has Ezariah calling from the fire, Do not let us be put to shame, but deal with us in your kindness and great mercy. We often search for God in our moments of deep suffering and pain. 
However, I don't think it's a coincidence that our first reading is spoken from an all-consuming fire. For Christians, suffering and precarity can yield great transformation. Today's Psalm 2 is coming from a time of injustice and oppression. The psalmist clearly knows grief and petitions God for compassion. But he also prays, Your ways, O Lord, make known to me. Teach me your paths. The Jesus of Matthew's Gospel is that great teacher, showing us the path to holiness and wholeness, teaching us both through parables and by the very example of his life and death. So what are we to do with the difficult teaching of Jesus about forgiveness? I think this teaching is uniquely important right now during Lent, because forgiveness is difficult, but it requires us to give up something. Maybe more than giving up, it requires a burning in the fire or a death on the cross. We have to give up our commitment to being right. We have to give up our commitment to our surviving self, our wounded ego. Frankly, we must be willing to let our wounded, merely surviving selves die. We can do this by giving our whole heart to the concerns of others. From this death rises a true self, a self that we want to be, free of the burden of merely surviving, of painfully protecting the ego. We can become the self that God created, my self, free of fear. In the words of Azariah, so let our sacrifice be in your presence today as we follow you unreservedly. For those who trust in you cannot be put to shame. And now we follow you with our whole heart.